Good evening and welcome to Aware on the Air for the 30th week of 2011. A madman killed a hundred people in a faraway country this month, but he did it in our name and we should do something about it. I'm not talking about Norway. I'm talking about Libya, Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Somalia, and Yemen. And the madman is the President of the United States. In fact, it's probably far more than 100 people. It's very hard to find the total number of fatalities uh, for which he's responsible uh, even in the last month. Our program is presented by members and friends of AWARE, the anti-war, anti-racism effort of Champaign-Urbana, a local peace group, and brought to you by Urbana Public Television. Each week at this time, we bring you news and comments about the wars that the United States government is conducting around the world and about the opposition to them here and across the country by people like us who see that these war wars betray our democratic principles. Today, the U.S. government is threatening, invading, and occupying countries from North Africa to the Indian subcontinent from, and from Central Asia to the Horn of Africa a vast circle with a 2,000-mile radius, sometimes called the Greater Middle East. The U.S. military calls it Central Command. This region has the world's largest concentration of oil and natural gas, and our government is spending hundreds of billions of dollars, and many lives, month after month to control it. Control and not just access to these energy resources is what the U.S. government wants. We, in fact, import very little oil from the Mideast, contrary to what you've heard, but control of it gives the U.S. government an unparalleled advantage over its oil-hungry rivals in Europe and Asia. We are killing people in the Mideast and North Africa because China needs oil, and our government wants to control where they get it. Our government says that we're conducting these vastly expensive and murderous wars to stop terrorism and protect civilians. But we can see that instead we're killing civilians and creating terrorists. These wars are against the interests of the vast majority of Americans. But the war policy remains essentially the same whether the Republicans or the Democrats are in office. The Obama administration is at least as eager as earlier ones to kill people to maintain control of the region. More than a thousand members of the U.S. military have died in Afghanistan alone since Obama, Obama became president. Of course, many more Afghans than that have died, and many more Americans than that have received serious injuries. I'm Carl Estabrook. Tonight on Aware on the Air, We'll have comments from Ron Zoke on, and I wrote this down, and I still forget, Omens of War. Omens of War. Well, that was certainly as appropriate. Uh, Carol Atkins on Keep On Trucking to the Taliban. Uh, perhaps uh, Ed Mandel on the Ostend Manifesto. Uh, and I will have a comment about... Uh, uh, military and economic tactics. Uh, why don't we begin with Ron Zoke on omens of war. Yes, what I'm going to talk about mainly is some of the economic uh, determinants of war as I see it and some of the uh, enablers uh, of war who are contributing to the current economic uh, crises starting with a piece by uh, Holly Scar Sklar published on Common Dream, CEOs to workers, more for me, less for you. Big company CEOs got a 23% raise last year overall, and corporate profits are at, a record, at record highs. But the minimum wage has less buying power now than in 1956, the year Elvis Presley first topped the charts. <laughs> Videotape was breakthrough technology, and the Dow closed above 500 for the very first time. It's no accident, she says, that wages are down while corporate profits are up. As J.P. Morgan's, Morgan's July 11th Eye on the Market newsletter put it, reductions in wages and benefits explain the majority 
of the net improvements in profit margins. U.S. labor compensation is now at a 50-year low relative to both company sales and U.S. GDP, gross domestic product. The minimum wage sets the floor under wages, and that floor is sinking. The 1956 minimum wage was $8.30 adjusted for inflation. Today's minimum wage is $7.25 an hour, or just $15,080 annually. So uh, the uh, position of uh, American workers is receding. All around the world, there are more uh, omens of economic uh, trouble, inequality, growing differentiation between the, the few rich and the uh, many poor with the middle class being ground out gradually in between, although a lot of those middle class people have not uh, woken up yet to this fact. Another piece from the local daily uh, on July 23rd, Associated Press, corporate profits boom, jobs, wages still a bust. Many companies are expanding overseas, but not here. The theory of the economic crisis among uh, our conservative friends is that uh, the job creators, uh, the uh, big rich, the uh, captains of industry, the tycoons uh, on Wall Street are not making enough money, so they are not uh, investing in uh, uh, creating jobs for the rest of us. Uh, when, the, when they do get more money, the record shows they don't create more jobs. They invest it uh, overseas, where it's a major proportion now, uh, after globalization, of their uh, profits are coming from. So they are insisting that uh, they should get uh, millions upon millions upon tens of millions of dollars for their uh, efforts as uh, managers of these companies, but uh, uh, is it trickling down to the rest of us? Uh, apparently not. Another item from Reuters, Companies Turn Out Profits But Not Jobs by Stephen C. Johnson. Mm -hmm. The sluggish pace of hiring may be hobbling the U.S. economy, but it's not been holding back big U.S. companies' profits thanks to growth overseas and cost controls at home. And that's, a, that's bad news for more than 14 million am Americans without jobs. So the pattern has become the corporations are producing more and more with fewer and fewer American uh, workers. And uh, they uh, get the increased productivity by squeezing more and more work out of fewer and fewer people. And if they have fewer people, they have to pay fewer uh, benefits. And so uh, it's working beautifully for them. Meanwhile, uh, uh, screaming and, and moaning about uh, corporate tax rates and so on. This discussion is typically carried on in terms of the nominal rates of uh, corporate income taxes without ever telling you that what they actually pay is far less than that. Most corporations in this country actually pay no income tax at all at last report, some 60 some uh, percent of them, but uh, they never mention that fact. They'll keep pointing to the nominal rates and not discussing the many exceptions, sub subsidies, loopholes, and so on that exist in the uh, uh, multi-thousand page tax code uh, for those uh, companies. So uh, what's happening uh, to the money? Uh, here's an indication. Headline, U.S. wastes $34 billion in Afghan and Iraq contracting. Reuters again, the United States has wasted some $34 billion on service contracts with the private sector in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, according to a study being finalized by Congress. So we never hear this from our suddenly thrifty uh, Republican and right-wing friends in Congress who are uh, continually battering Obama and the Democrats with the notion that there's this enormous uh, deficit and uh, uh, the national debt, which is increasing. Uh, so apparently there's some taboo against uh, discussing the financing of the war. 
And I've asked my friend Carol Atkins to come in and tell us something about another piece that has appeared recently about what's happening to some of the money that's being sent to uh, Afghanistan. Carol? Where does the money go? Huh? Yeah, where does the money go? It's cash from part of a $2.16 billion U.S. transportation contract in Afghanistan has ended up in the hands of Taliban insurgents, the Pentagon said on Monday. The disclosure is another example of the persistent difficulty the U.S. military has in keeping its mass, massive war funding from reaching insurgents. It is fighting in the unpopular decade-old Afghan war. The United States is spending more than $6 billion a month in the conflict. Pentagon officials have repeatedly warned the need to tighten control on U.S. contract and last year announced the creation of a task force to crack down on misuse of funds by contractors, some of who pay Taliban protection money. Pentagon spokesman Colonel David LePan said the discovery of the ciphering of the funds from the trucking con contract was part of the that previously announced effort. He had the U.S. military's Central Command, which oversees the Afghan war, aim to sign a new trucking contract tract in September. Central Command's contracting command is working on a new Afghan trucking contract to ensure greater transparency into subcontractors, Le Pen told reporters. The details from the internal study by NATO forces in Afghanistan were re first reported by the Washington Post. The news just came days after Reuters reported on a study being completed by a congressional committee showing that some $34 billion in U.S. taxpayers' dollar, dollars, dollars, can't pronounce that, have been wasted on contracts with the private sector in the war in Afghanistan and in, in Iraq. Thank you, Carol. Uh, that's just a small piece of the larger picture of uh, enormous uh, waste, uh, disappearance of funds. Uh, in Afghanistan, the uh, corruption there being, according to many sources, just all so all pervasive, so extreme, that it's uh, really hard uh, for Americans apparently to grasp the uh, extent of it. The analysis by the Commission on Wartime Contracting, details of which were first reported by the Wall Street Journal, offers the most complete look so far at the misuse of U.S. contracting funds in Afghanistan and Iraq where more than $200 billion has been doled out in the contracts and grants for nearly a decade. Another piece that appeared, uh, same story, uh, different writer, Ben Farmer in Kabul. U.S. squandered $21 billion British pounds on private contractors in Afghanistan and Iraq. That's the equivalent amount of money. Waste mismanagement and poorly conceived projects mean the United States could have lost more than 15% of the total given out in contracts and grants. America will have, sp have spent 128 million pounds on private contracts and grants by the end of September. You can translate that into uh, dollars. The coalition al allies rely on hired staff for everything from feeding troops and cleaning latrines to guarding convoys, manning surveillance equipment, and building schools and wells. Around 209,000 contractors were on the U.S. payroll at one time, 60,000 more than the combined number of U.S. troops now in the two countries, and so on. You can look that up uh, for yourself uh, <laughs> if you believe that uh, uh, we're exaggerating or are using uh, phony figures. So uh, I'll stop there with that. Uh, thread and uh, turn it over to Carl. This is, uh, this is uh, very important stuff, and it's not <laughs> reported, of course, in the mainstream media. We don't hear about uh, where, where does the money go. And uh, uh, I came across a strange thing this week that talked about that in a very odd way, um, but that uh, illustrates uh, another question that we don't ask, that is, what do Afghans think? Uh, the U.S. is conducting a war there and inv invaded their country, been there for 11 years, almost 11 years, and the uh, war uh, the war continues. Uh, and very rarely do we hear from Afghans, except from our Afghans, people like Hamad Karzai, uh, who the U.S. made president of Afghanistan, um, and uh, we hear when, uh, you know, his, uh, his brother is rubbed out, uh, but uh, we don't... Uh, really hear much more about uh, what 
people in Afghanistan think. They do have websites, though, and there's an interesting one called Kabul Press. Uh, Kabul Press is, in fact, a website. You can find it under that name uh, in the uh, Afghan capital. The, the site, strangely enough, appears in Persian, that is Farsi, Farsi language, language of Iran, and in English. Now, I suppose the notion is these are the two, two powers that uh, in Afghanis Afghanistan would have to deal with uh, if it had an independent government, which it doesn't. Uh, it's an online media outlet from the middle of Afghanistan, updated apparently each day like a newspaper. Its editor is a man called Cameron Mirhazar. He's been arrested several times by the Afghan secret police. That's Karzai's people, that is the American uh, back secret police, um, and has been defended by international freedom of press organizations. But he puts out a very odd uh, publication that's worth looking at. For example, uh, on Saturday, uh, the following headline was found in the Kabul press, Taliban to bail out Obama from debt crisis. Mullah Omar, second headline, Mullah Omar, that is the head of the Taliban, the resistance group in, in Afghanistan, Mullah Omar lectures President Obama on, quote, how to wage war and still make a profit, close quote. Um, the article is attributed to one Matthew Nasuti, uh, and it uh, goes as follows, uh, not a little bit of the onion maybe, a little bit of, uh, <laughs> of, of Private Eye, the British uh, satirical magazine, or La Canard, the, the French one. According to reliable sources, it says, negotiations are underway, which would have Mullah Mohammed Omar loan President Barack Obama enough money so that the United States does not default on its financial obligations. During the secret debt relief talks, Mullah Omar reportedly lectured President Obama on how to wage war and still make a profit. The Taliban have no debt and do not need any debt limit increases as they are flush with millions in opium revenues and acquired U.S. NATO funds. Uh, the acquired is in quotation marks for reasons we just heard. The massive diversion of Afghan aid funds to the Taliban is detailed in the Kabul Press investigative report, quote, Petraeus fires an admiral who tried to stop Taliban funding, close quote. Under, under the debt relief deal, the Taliban would dispatch a financial aid and assistance team, F-A-A-A-T, to help train Obama administration officials in financial responsibility. Some of the FAT's preliminary findings are, one, the U.S. State Department's budget is bloated by as much as $25 billion and can be safely cut. That's you know. <laughs> Two, American diplomats are poorly trained, overpaid, and ineffective and should all be sent home. <laughs> Three, U.S. aid development has primarily benefited a small group of politically connected Afghan families and should be terminated. USAID should instead focus exclusively on humanitarian aid, food, and health assistance. Four, U.S. security contractors, i.e. mercenaries, and that's in the text, I'm not adding that, are a blight on America's image and reputation, in addition to being excessively expensive, and should all be disbanded. The State Department should return to the use of U.S. Marines as embassy security guards. Five, due to the current 25% annual desertion rate, Afghan army and police training is not cost effective, and new ideas need to be explored, including a much smaller and more professional force, perhaps capped at 100,000. Six, the massive American war effort in Afghanistan has generated huge volumes of trash, oils, spent munitions, and hazardous waste. Its operations have also caused extensive damage to the forests, deserts, groundwater, and other natural resources of Afghanistan. It is estimated that as much as $100 billion will be needed to excavate and remove all this waste from Afghanistan and to restore the countryside. The U.S. government needs to begin budgeting for these costs. See the April-May 2010 three-part Kabul press series, which analyzed this $100 billion. Now, that's quite a remarkable piece. As I say, the editor uh, is in Kabul. It is called Kabul Press and is online from, uh, from apparently, Kabul. Um, I don't know. If I were that editor, I'm not sure I'd start my own automobile, you know? I mean, uh, uh, I, in fact, I think I'd buy a plane ticket for, you know, faraway places. But, uh,
Oh, that's really uh, funny. It does read like something from The Onion. But, but uh, it's all true. Yes, yes. That's the thing. <laughs> the Onion recently got a journalism award because so much of the stuff, while completely uh, uh, fantasy, is so dead on on so many things that uh, uh, it uh, deserves some kind of uh, award, I think. Absolutely right. Tom Lehrer, the political, uh, political and social satirist from many, many years ago, who was actually an instructor of mine in college, um, Tom Lehrer, uh, is still remembered after all these years, he hasn't made a, an album in many, many years, uh, for the things he did from the 50s to the 70s. Um, and uh, when asked, well, as far as I know, he's still alive and well, but when asked a while ago why he didn't, he stopped doing it, he said, once they gave the Nobel Peace Prize to Henry Kissinger, it wasn't possible to do satire anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he had never seen the, the Peace Prize being given to Barack Obama. Yeah. So, uh, you are watching Aware on the Air, presented each week at this time by members and friends of the anti-war, anti-racism effort of Champaign-Urbana, a local peace group. Uh, a word about the calendar. Today is July 26th. On this day, one year ago, in one of the biggest leaks in U.S. military history, more than 90,000 internal records of U.S. military actions in Afghanistan, that is from the military, not from Kabul Press, uh, were published by the whistleblower website WikiLeaks. The documents provided a devastating portrait of the war in Afghanistan, revealing how coalition forces, that's the euphemism for the U.S. and its NATO underlings, have killed hundreds of civilians in unreported incidents, how a secret black ops special forces unit, that's a death squad, hunts down targets for assassination or detention without trial. Uh, that's what made uh, General McChrystal's, General Petraeus' reputation, you know, leading, leading uh, uh, death squads like that. How Taliban attacks have soared and how Pakistan is fueling the insurgency. But in the year since the release of all these documents, these trends have continued and accelerated, making the past year the deadliest since the U.S. invasion in 2001. Two-thirds of the U.S. public is against the war and think we should end it. But the U.S. is not democratic. Two-thirds of the Congress supports the war, so Obama can continue to kill people there with his goofy new Defense Secretary Leon Panetta and the nasty little death squad leader David Petraeus at the CIA. It is not a happy anniversary. Upcoming events, uh, next Saturday, AWARE will be at the Farmer's Market in Lincoln Square as usual. Uh, we'll have information about the war, uh, bumper stickers, banners, uh, uh, buttons, paraphernalia of various types uh, about the war. Uh, come by and uh, have a word. If our program interests you, you might want to look at these other programs heard regularly throughout the week here on UPTV. The White House Chronicle, Sunday morning at 7 a.m., repeated Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Democracy Now!, weekdays at 7 a.m. The Big Picture with Tom Hartman, weekdays at 8 a.m. Labor's Worldview with our friends Dave Johnson and Jim Iman, <laughs> noon on Sundays. The David Pakman Show, Saturdays at 7 a.m., and repeated through the week. Uh, there are two series that are on right now, and I've managed to misplace the titles of their particular programs this week, but Populist Dialogues is heard Thursday at 1.30 p.m. and Essential Dissent Sunday at 2 p.m. What they've been doing here is showing um, uh, lectures that have uh, filled by uh, very interesting people like Norman Finkelstein, filmed some time ago, uh, also contemporary discussions with people uh, on topics uh, related to what we discuss here. Uh, anything else we have coming up, uh, ladies and gentlemen? Uh, no. Well, the following week, of course, the first Saturday in uh, August, we will again, I assume, be doing our monthly uh, demonstration uh, near the corner of Neal and Main Streets in downtown uh, Champaign between 2 and 4 p.m. So I invite people to come there to uh, uh, talk with us, to read our signs, and find out uh, what we're about uh, at that time. Quite right. And with the help of our director, Jason Liggett, we can put up on the screen now something that uh, comes from the very good group War is a Crime in Washington. This October marks the beginning. <laughs> I, 
Like I don't have the... We are ordinary citizens. We represent millions who are completely shut out of the political conversation. We will be shut out no longer. We will be heard. We will be... We will be heard. We will be represented. The majority of Americans... A majority... A majority of Americans want the wars to end. We want investment in jobs, education, and environmental protection. We want banks to invest in our future, not in their executives' pocketbooks. We want laws that are just. Lawmakers who obey them. And the power to make them accountable when they don't. We will no longer abide by the outrageous and growing wealth inequality in this nation. We will not accept a government of, by, and for the corporations. We will not remain silent when our government continues to slaughter and kill innocent people in foreign lands. We will not remain silent while millions have no access to health care. We are. We are. We are. We are a movement. We're a movement. We are the October 2011 movement. This October marks the beginning of the 11th year of the U.S. invasion and destruction of Afghanistan. This October, austerity measures will no longer be limited to individual states. This October, federal budget cuts will hit home. This October, the federal budget will deliver unlimited war funds, corporate subsidies, and tax breaks for the super rich, while cutting services for human and environmental needs. But in October, a growing number of us will mark the beginning of something else in the United States. A moment when we will unite to demand an end to a system that puts profits and warfare over the welfare of people and the environment. We will make these demands heard by beginning a prolonged, long, prolonged, a prolonged occupation of Washington, D.C. We will make these demands heard by beginning a prolonged occupation of Washington, D.C. on October 6th. It ends when we say it ends. Let me repeat that. It ends when we say it ends. We are not naive. We know the monolith we challenge. Corporatism is behind these wars. Corporatism ignores majority support for Medicare for All. Corporatism prevents effective regulation of the finance industry. Corporatism stands in the way of a more sustainable energy economy. Corporatism is at the root of the foreclosure crisis. Corporatism resists real job creation. And corporatism exploits human beings and the planet for profit. Every day, the monolithic corporate machine moves us closer to the precipice. The October 2011 coalition is bringing people of conscience together to stop the machine and create a new world. None of us can do this alone. History is knocking. Answer. this run for a minute because I think we get a list of the uh, participants in that piece. Uh, that was an announcement of a uh, of a action beginning October 6th in Washington DC. The people behind it, some of them you may have recognized, are folks who have been involved in the anti-war movement for a long time. Uh, folks like uh, Chris Hedges and uh, Glenn Ford and uh, David Swanson, uh, other people who have uh, agreed that the situation uh, of the war and the economy are such that it's going to be necessary to do the sort of thing in Washington that was done in Cairo, uh, that the Arab Spring has got to come to Washington. We have to have an American fall. Uh, with uh, beginning in October in Washington, D.C. And they intend to set up an, account, uh, an, account, an encampment like Tahrir Square in Cairo in Washington, an open-ended encampment. This is not just a weekend demonstration or a one-day demonstration, a march on Washington of the sort uh, that goes back to the uh, Vietnam War demonstrations, uh, the civil rights demonstrations. This is meant to be an ongoing encampment in Washington, D.C., uh, with people from all over the country, indeed all over the world, coming and supporting it and aligning this demonstration in Washington with those demonstrations around the world. Remarkably enough, there were demonstrations in Tel Aviv, in Israel, this last week. Uh, people are going so far as to suggest that the Arab Spring may be followed by an Israeli summer. Uh, objections to the government of, uh, of Israel, uh, like the objections to the government of Egypt. Uh, 
President Mubarak, who was driven uh, out of the government in Egypt, was explicitly linked to, paralleled with, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu in Israel by the demonstrators in Tel Aviv the other night. Uh, the notion that uh, demonstrations in the West Bank as well uh, will lead up to the Palestinian uh, presentation to the UN General Assembly this, small, this fall calling for uh, a state, uh, recognition of the statehood of the Palestinian people uh, in the West Bank and Gaza. So it, uh, there's a range of activities, all of which uh, bear a certain similarity because they are, as the uh, spokespeople in that uh, announcement we just saw put it, uh, aligned against the corporatism that stands behind the American wars in the Middle East and indeed the governments that are being challenged by the Arab Spring and perhaps by the Israeli summer as well. So uh, there are a lot of things on the horizon. Uh, it's uh, an important business uh, and I'm actually making arrangements to go to Washington in October. So uh, yeah. I think it's something we can suggest. Let me embroider uh, that uh, a bit. Uh, what's happening in Israel is uh, interesting. Will the Arab Spring spread there? In the local newspaper again, Thursday, July 21st, from Jerusalem, AP, first came a revolt over cheese that forced Israel's largest dairy companies to lower their prices as uh, uh, the pr price of food and of housing is going up of food and fuel uh, pretty much around the world. Now this says, with consumer rage mounting over what is widely seen as a staggering cost of living, tent camps have sprung up across Israel to protest housing prices that climbed while the costs fell globally amid the world's financial meltdown. The camps draw inspiration from the mass demonstrations in the Arab world and illustrate Israel's paradox while its economy is roaring, many Israelis aren't enjoying the good times. The country has one of the highest poverty rates and income gaps in the developed world. Food prices have surged in recent months, as have fuel costs, while recent strikes by social workers and doctors spotlight how the frustration has cut across all layers of the society. So uh, there it is. Next. Uh, thread then. Will the Arab Spring spread to Sub-Saharan Africa or Black Africa as it's sometimes called? Again from the New York Times, July 23rd, When Wealth Breeds Rage by John Githongo, Chief Executive of the Imuka Tr Kenya Trust, this says, and Chairman of the Africa Institute for Governing with Integrity. He was Kenya's permanent secretary for governance and ethics from 2003 to 2005. Across the Middle East, he said, and North Africa, superficial political calm has been shattered by convulsions of rage. Idealistic young protesters have toppled some of the most ruthless and well-resourced political strongmen on the planet. In Sub-Saharan Africa, men are asking, will the Arab Spring spread south? So what this writer notices and what many of the younger people, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, are noticing is the radical and growing economic inequality uh, animated much of what was at stake in the various uprisings and are beginning to think about whether that could happen too. These people are, this author says, Africa's overwhelming majority, poor, marginalized, and angry about corruption and soro soaring food and fuel prices, it is these young men and women who endure the daily humiliations of poverty, struggling to find jobs as elites crow about growth and an African uh, renaissance. The much touted middle class remains a tiny sliver of the population in most African countries, one that is largely dependent on state patronage for its survival. Meanwhile, the poor are assaulted daily by the potent symbols of rising inequality, glitzy malls filled with designer goods and status-enhancing baubles that cost 10 times the monthly minimum wage. Jealousy of ill-gotten gains is particularly acute among members of the giant 
youth bulge across Africa and the Middle East. In Kenya, for example, over 70% of the population is younger than 34, and that population is growing at one million a year. This resentment is only heightened by the tools of the information age, which remind them that they have been excluded from feeding, feeding at the trough enjoyed so blatantly by the nouveau riche, a style, lifestyle that is showcased by the newly minted wealthy on television, Twitter, Facebook, and the web in infuriating detail. Globalization has changed the aspirations of the poor and expectations will follow. So a revolution of rising expectations, of course, has become a recent uh, uh, cliche in uh, accounting for these movements across the globe. They are, uh, these things are driving young Africans into the streets, this author says, to challenge their kleptocap kleptocratic governments, if the Arabs' uh, resolutions have taught us anything, is, it is that inequality and perceptions of inequality within poor countries have now replaced poverty as the number one development challenge facing the world. Consequently, the struggle for mitigate inequality rather than making poverty history through debt relief has become the most urgent task. Narrowing wealth disparities within nations rather than among them is now paramount. As growth has spread and e accelerated, so has inequality, what is commonly called uh, growth, uh, by the way here, is a uh, rising uh, GDP and uh, without regard to uh, how that's distributed or any considerations of social justice. And that's why I question and uh, have severe doubts about uh, uh, economic uh, growth, whether that will be a solution for anything. Economic growth and urbanization combined with high levels of youth unemployment and conspicuous consumption on a part of the corrupt, corrupt ruling elite create a situation in which growth exacerbates <coughs> political volatility instead of uh, quelling it. China is aware of this and is trying to do something about it. But uh, uh, there's a question about whether Central Africa can deal with it. We've seen again and again in uh, Latin America this dynamic work out that uh, inequality, uh, ever more conspicuous and extreme inequality, will eventually reach a tipping point and lead to insurrection, which will be followed by a civil war, which will then invite foreign intervention. And so it goes on and on. <laughs> Carl? Uh, the uh, austerity <coughs> programs that are being instituted across the world uh, are not uh, separate from what our government is doing here at home. We talk about austerity in Greece. We don't talk about the uh, various economic problems about which we heard from President Obama and Speaker Boehner last night as an austerity program, but that's exactly what it is. An austerity program is a way of translating <coughs> wealth from the majority to the few, to the rich. Uh, a transfer that has been going on for 30 years in this country, uh, a transfer that has been going on in an accelerating fashion for 30 years in this country. Now after the financial crisis of 2007-2008, we've uh, come to the point of saying that uh, it's necessary to institute uh, programs in this country that deal with the debt, the deficit, and the results of that, uh, 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 of that financial crisis, particularly uh, insofar as they help the, and you use the magic phrase, Ron, job creators. Yeah. The job creators being apparently those captains of industry who are going to hire all those folks who need jobs in this country. We have massive unemployment in this country, much worse perhaps than the government figures really admit because they count jobs in a sort of optimistic fashion. If you uh, mowed your neighbor's lawn this week and um, uh, uh, got paid for it, uh, and didn't do anything else and to made money, uh, you're counted as employed. Uh, you know, you had a job after all, didn't you? Uh, so this is uh, the situation that we face in this country right now, and it was clear to many people um, that, uh, and not just people on the left, people who are part of the economic establishment, that the first job the new president should do in the Obama administration was to produce jobs. 
eighty percent of Americans said that was what he should devote himself to. He chose not to. He chose instead to uh, turn to deficit reduction, a uh, a, a complete um, uh, charade, a uh, a false problem. Uh, that was underlined once again in a little noticed report a week ago from the Congressional Budget Office. Uh, note what the Congressional Budget, Budget Office said when you hear these uh, horrendous cries of alarm at the deficit uh, that must be dealt with one way or another, uh, cries of alarm that we hear from all sides of the political spectrum in Congress. Uh, the Congressional Bud Budget Office said that if Congress did nothing, nothing in regard to the economy. Congress did nothing other than what it normally does in regard to the economy. <clears throat> By the end of the next presidential term, the deficit would go away. Now, what that's doing, the Congressional Budget Office, uh, uh, economists, uh, uh, mathematicians, folks who spend time looking at the numbers and trying to figure out which way the trends are going and so forth, they're looking at the things that are in train now in terms of income, in terms of expenditures and so forth. Uh, we're prescinding a moment from the uh, silly dispute over the debt ceiling. Uh, and this is a made-up dispute, mainly uh, uh, to allow each uh, uh, of the business parties to uh, have a chance at blaming the other business party for the bad economy. Uh, but uh, the Congressional Budget Office is doing its, putting in its hours, uh, going about its business, uh, examining the business of the United States, pointed out that at the end of the next presidential term, that is uh, in 2016, um, the, if present trends continue, if the Congress does nothing unusual at all, uh, the deficit goes away. Now, uh, that's remarkable because, of course, uh, it's the deficit that the President tells us he had to attend to rather than job creation, yeah. rather than the thing that Americans really do need and want. Now, uh, comparisons are drawn sometimes between uh, Barack Obama and Franklin Roosevelt uh, because comparisons are drawn between the recent Great Recession uh, and the ongoing Great Recession and the Great Depression of the 1930s. But in fact, their procedures were very different. Roosevelt, uh, who realized that if capitalism was going to be saved, something must be done, did things like providing jobs. The Works Progress Administration pr employed 11 million people in, 19 in the years after 1933. Uh, now, that itself was already uh, a, a compromise because of the tremendous hostility of the job creators of those days, that is, those who own factories, uh, the financiers and corporate uh, executives of America in the 1930s. Naturally, they didn't want the government providing jobs. It was obvious. If the government provided jobs, then you would not have that great reserve army of the unemployed that kept wages down for the big employers in the country as a whole. Uh, instead of taking whatever was offered for whatever jobs uh, might be made available by the job creators, uh, a potential employee could go across the street and go to work for the government. Uh, could go to work, could get a government job, and a government job which was supposed to pay uh, what finally was a living wage. So there was furious attempts to ban Roosevelt as a socialist and a communist and worse, uh, and simply because they job, a job, a jobs program uh, was begun. Now, the Obama administration has come nowhere near that, not even any step towards it when what is required is a much more, uh, if a, a much a broader uh, WPA, a much broader Works Progress Administration. Obama could and should have said at the beginning of his term that the solution for uh, the re Great Recession in the United States was employment and that federal jobs of living age should be made available to all Americans who want them. Uh, if you do that, as the conservative economist Milton Friedman pointed out many years ago, there's a lot of things you could get rid of, uh, including uh, uh, the, the sorts of supports now that make up for the fact that people don't have jobs, unemployment insurance, and so yeah, forth. Yeah. Um, now, uh, in fact, 
the Obama administration did nothing like it and instead looked for ways to please those job creators and then went after the various programs that help people who don't have jobs now. They went after Social Security, they went after Medicare, they went after Medicaid. This is outrageous. Many people who supported Barack Obama for president couldn't believe it when that was the, tr that was the turn that this administration took. Uh, we should be uh, looking for ways to uh, uh, call Barack Obama home again and tell him that uh, his uh, characteristic maneuver of faking left and driving right is now no longer acceptable. Something else must be done. Again, let me embellish part of that by uh, bringing you some words from this piece that was in Forbes magazine by one John T. Harvey, who was identified as a professor of economics at uh, Texas Christian University, I believe it is. He says, dump the debt limit and address the real problem. As everyone knows, the big economic news today is the breakdown of talks on the debt limit. Media outlets have been bombarding us with horror stories that list the catastrophic consequences of failing to reach an agreement. We are told that the government may default, programs shut down and financial collapse follow, and indeed it would create myriad problems. Unfortunately, however, it's all for no good reason whatsoever. This is political grandstanding and smoke and mirrors, and the cost will be paid by the average American. There's no logical economic reason, he says, not to raise the limit. In fact, the real question is why we even have one. As I've explained repeatedly in this blog, it is impossible for the United States to default on debt that is denominated in dollars. The whole promise upon which these talks are based, that if we don't get deficit spending under control, then we'll go bankrupt, is fundamentally flawed. In actuality, the real need right now is to stimulate aggregate demand by spending more. There's nothing standing between us and economic recovery but this. We have ample capacity to produce goods and services. Business and finance costs are low, and there are plenty of idle resources. So why aren't firms hiring? because they know damn well that they can't sell anything when they have almost 15 million unemployed workers. And yet we're told by Washington, both parties, but, but particularly the Republicans, that the solution is to lower sales even more by cutting back on what the government has been purchasing. That will apparently encourage business to take on new employees. This is nothing short of idiotic. Lord help us, because apparently our policymakers are in no hurry to do so. Not only can't they agree, they aren't even focusing on the real problem. So this was immediately attacked uh, by people who accused him of uh, uh, Keynesianism. <laughs> <laughs> the key phrase, of course, being uh, increasing aggregate demand. And uh, uh, it uh, uh, really uh, antagonized a bunch of people, but it seems to me there's a lot of merit in this position. Cool. Thank you, Ron. I uh, remind you, you are watching Aware on the Air, presented each week at this time by members and friends of the anti-war, anti-racism effort of Champaign-Urbana. We mention at the beginning of each show that the administration's war policy subverts democracy and constitutional government. The latest example being Obama's attack on Libya, contrary to the War Powers Act and the Constitution, uh, and about that, by the way, our congressmen and others, uh, uh, other congresspeople, are quite rightly suing the Obama administration. But now it seems clear that the government's emergency economic policy uh, may, uh, whatever emerges, in other words, from the uh, um, uh, peculiar dance that's occurring in Washington right now, uh, will also be undemocratic and unconstitutional. How, you ask? Compare the tactics used to railroad the passage of the TARP uh, legislation, the Troubled Assets uh, Reform Program that began of the Bush administration and was accomplished by the Obama administration. Compare those tactics and the current contrived, as Ron was just pointing out, debt ceiling crisis. The similarities have increased in a predictably bad way. Even worse than the economic toll radical budget cutting will impose on ordinary Americans is the continued undermining of basic democratic processes. 
the short-term and long-term results are both very bad. The foundation was set with the TARP radical power grab, which is what it was, the first bank, the first phrase of bank bailouts. Uh, the um, uh, Treasury under the Bush uh, administration treasurer, uh, Hank Paulson, uh, presented in a, in a draft of that program, the program which, as I say, was put in place by the Obama administration. And that original draft contained a very interesting passage. I quote, decisions by the Secretary, Secretary of the Treasury, pursuant to the authority of this act are non-reviewable and committed to agency discretion and may not be reviewed by any court or any administrative agency. Now, <laughs> that was the way, that was, the, that was the original part, TARP law, which by the way was one piece of paper. We've been hearing about all these complex laws. It was one piece of paper that uh, the Bush administration, hey, the Bush administration has a, uh, an example of what a 19th century historian referred to as the terrible simplifiers. You know, uh, they simplified things. Here, here's one piece in this, where essentially we'll take over the economy and the banking system. Puts the Treasury's actions beyond the rule of law. That's what they were doing. A financial coup d'etat the only limitation is 700 billion balance sheet figure. That is, they can only do this with 700 billion dollars. The measure already gave the Treasury the authority not simply to buy dud mortgage paper, but other assets as it deemed fit. There was no accountability beyond a report, contents undefined, to Congress three months into the program and semi-annually afterwards. Every half year, the Treasury had to say what it was doing with the money. The Treasury could, via incompetence or venality, grossly overpay for assets and advisory services, fail to exclude, to exclude consultants with conflicts of interest, and there would be no recourse. Uh, we see how the Afghans, Afghanistan war is run, and obviously those pr procedures would come home. Given the truly appalling track record of this administration in the war, uh, it was not, and of the Bush administration in the war, it was not an idle worry. Uh, now, what happened was that the uh, initial TARP was rejected by the Congress, in part because of this offensive passage. Uh, but it was put in place, and the administration, the Obama administration and the Bush administration, worked hard to escape any constraints on its action, uh, as it had done in regard to other civil liberties, uh, Guantanamo, rendition, torture, warrantless wiretaps, uh, the threat of terrorism and the war against uh, uh, the, the overseas contingency operations, as the Obama administration euphemistically called it. These were justifications for these activities, including the economic activities. Um, the TARP, along with the new extra-legal legislative processes that are part that were part of, of of a bailout bill was essentially an enabling act an enabling act is well known in recent political history uh, the uh, most famous one of course being the German enabling act of 1933 but it changes the nature of the political system because it exert it, it exempts these emergency institutions from uh, the rule of law. Now, I rehearse this history because that's what's being proposed, that's what well may emerge from the discussions this week, from this posturing we saw last night from Speaker Boehner and President Obama. Uh, there is talk uh, and will apparently be part of whatever agreement emerges from uh, the Republican, uh, Republicans and Democrats in the Congress, of a super Congress. Uh, they don't use that term, but uh, it's a group, a committee, composed of members of both chambers and both parties. Uh, naturally, this doesn't look, don't look for this in the Constitution, it's not there, but it would have extraordinary new powers. Uh, the plan, first mentioned by uh, Senate Minority Leader McConnell and Majority Leader Reid, uh, would be accompanied, the uh, raising the debt limit would be accompanied by a 12-member panel made up of 12 lawmakers, six from each chamber and six from each party. Legislation approved by the Super Congress, this commission, uh, 
would then be fast-tracked through both chambers, through the House and the Senate, where it couldn't be amended by normal processes, or by simple, regular, everyday lawmakers. Uh, you know, they'd be able to scrape off those nasty concerns that people like Dennis Kucinich and Ron Paul keep raising. Uh, they, wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't have a say on it because they'd be only up and, only up and down votes, up or down votes, uh, would be allowed. Uh, with the weight of both leaderships behind it, leadership of the House, leadership of the Senate, a product originated by the Super Congress would have a strong chance of moving through the Little Congress and quickly becoming law. A Super Congress would be less accountable than the system that exists today and would find it easier to strip the public of popular benefits, because that's the real issue, you know. Uh, we've got to find some way to get rid of what is called in Washington entitlements. We have to get, find some way to get rid of Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, which is what is deeply desired by the job creators. Uh, it's what Barack Obama was sent to Washington to do, or at least that's what he feels he was sent to Washington to do. That's what he's working on. Uh, negotiators, uh, negotiators are currently considering cutting the mortgage deduction uh, and tax credits for retirement savings, for instance, extremely popular policies that would be difficult to slice up using the traditional legislative process. We've seen the outcry that uh, is coming back to haunt the Tea Partiers uh, when they said quite clearly and quite reasonably at the beginning of their campaign, uh, government hands off my Medicare. Right. That's the issue. But the Super Congress, uh, they wouldn't have that problem. Mm -hmm. You've been watching Aware on the Air for the 30th week of 2011, presented by members and friends of Aware, the anti-war, anti-racism effort of Champaign-Urbana, a local peace group. We meet every Sunday at 5 p.m. at the McKinley Foundation, 5th and Daniel Streets in Champaign. Visitors and new members are welcome. Aware is happy to provide any more speakers and discussion leaders for local events. See our Facebook page, search for Aware or write cge at shout.net. This program will be available there also, thanks to Jason Leggett of UPTV. God willing, we will be back next week to uh, talk about uh, the war and the opposition to it on Aware on the Air. My thanks to Ron Zoke and Carol Atkins and the many people of Aware, me members of Aware and friends of Aware who make the program possible. Uh, in the words of the late Edward Murrow, good night and good luck.